try standing the phone up until we get some kind of better iPod, uh, uh, tripod, whatever the heck they call it. We're not going to get this right. I'm going to hold the phone. I'm going to do the episode. It's July 5th. Hi. I wasted five minutes filming and uh, the thing turned off and I don't know how to mesh them together. So we got to start all over again. Something came up today, reminded me of a story that takes us back a good 45 years. We're in 2022, today's July 5th, and I'm talking about 1977. In 1977, uh, we were in the electronics business, we were reconditioning consumer electronics. We had a facility in Jersey City, New Jersey. We had about 100 employees. We were doing about 1,200 units a day. Some of them were Korean and Chinese. They were doing the repair work, quality control, inspection. And some of them were black and Hispanic doing the packing, the unpacking, the cleaning, the shipping, the receiving. And that was the operation. Something went on with the coffee breaks. Uh, where at one point my father turned around, they had 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, and 30 minutes for lunch, and he made some kind of change on that. And somewhere along the way, some of them decided to sue him with the New Jersey National Labor Relations Board, NLRB. We lost the lawsuit. And they were awarded $2 million, which I can't tell you in 1977, 78, what kind of monumental amount of money that was. Somehow now we wised up, we appealed, we went back, we refought the case, and the outcome was the same. We lost the case, but now the award was changed to a dollar. I was only 17, 18, I don't ask no questions. Bottom line, after that, we had a union. We had a union, and uh, now everything became an issue. You want to add a soda machine, you got to have a meeting with the union. They approve, they don't approve, 20 cents, 25 cents. Everything became an issue, and my father was very, very disgusted with the whole thing. Uh, he was approached by a gentleman who was in the electronics business. He was an importer. And the guy was heading into the handbag business because that was doing better for him. And he says, look, I have an Ashkenaz guy down in Georgia. The guy is running a small facility for me. He didn't use the word small. He's running a facility that accepts my returns, helps me generate the credits, creates the documentation, turns that goods around, repairs it, and sells it off there locally. And my father became intrigued, and he met with this guy, and I guess they had a couple of drinks together down in Georgia, and he decided he's going to go with the guy, and they signed a lease on a build to suit, a building that was going up at the time, concrete slab, brand new construction, 25,000 square feet. We only had 16,500 in Jersey City, and now we're going to have 25,000 more in, in Doraville, Georgia. And we at the same time made an arrangement with another company and we were getting their home stereo units. And we made another arrangement with another company where we bought two million hair dryers that had asbestos in it. And we figured out that if you just removed a layer of asbestos and closed the hair dryer back up, it wouldn't overheat anyway. So we removed the asbestos. We set a, pro a production line up for the hair dryers. We set up a massive production line for the home stereos with the speakers and the packaging and the way it was all done. And it was beautifully done, but we never had the level of productivity we needed to start to generate a profit. We were losing money in Georgia, losing money, losing money. We're sitting in a meeting. It is fourth quarter of 1979. And we realized that whatever we made in Jersey City for the previous few months, we lost in Georgia. And now they're sitting there and they're saying, somebody's got to get down there and see what the hell we could do about this. And I notice everybody in the room's looking at me. I says, me? <laughs> I'm 19. What are you talking about? 
I'm not going to Georgia. I'm going to go live in Georgia. And my uncle, my other uncle, and my father looking at me with a straight face. Who else is going to do it? We're married. What, so I should never get married? What, what? I mean, I, 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 not even going there. We don't have enough time for that show. In any event, I moved to Georgia because that's what I did in those days. Whatever my father said to do, I did. And the experience was a very difficult one. We had about five minutes, so we got a little time here. I'll start by saying I thought the Yankees were a baseball team. But to these people, a Yankee was the other side. That was the enemy in the Civil War. They never forgot it. It was 130 years later, but they were still holding on to that grudge. I was a Yankee, okay? But that didn't mean that I didn't like the Mets. That meant I'm from the North. And I was a Jew. And because I had about 120 employees in that facility, I was rich. So now I'm a rich Jewish Yankee sitting in Doraville, suburban Georgia. And I got to tell you that it was a very harrowing experience. And I know the word harrowing, but it doesn't make it into too many of my sentences on a daily basis. There is no other word for this time. Uh, I was facing death threats and all kinds of problems. I would try to go out and have a little bit bite to eat, a couple of mozzarella sticks and maybe a cold beer and we go to the bathroom after a beer or two, you see a sign, no Jews, uh, no blacks, no Jews, no dogs. Meaning you can't use the bathroom in that facility. And if you think it's a joke and you're going to laugh it off, first of all, it's four feet by six feet. It's not eight by t- t- ten in a little frame. And second of all, somebody will follow you in and smash your head against the freaking walls. These people didn't play around. Um, I stayed there two years in Georgia. I learned that America is a very different place than we think it is here in the comfort of New York and New Jersey. Okay, they may have less traffic and cheaper apartments, but we have uh, at least the freedom to be us without getting killed for it. I think about, you know, being a little kid growing up and you're picking teams for uh, (coughs) to play wiffle ball or touch football or something. And I picked this one, you picked that one, I picked this one. You know who picked you, you know which team you're on. You're not going to start playing for the other team while you're on the first team, right? I mean, you got picked. Over here, the team you were on was with the blacks and the dogs. You were not one of the other people. You weren't on the white side. I know there's a Jewish community now. I know the internet makes it more visible. It illuminates it somewhat. It connects it somewhat. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not in Atlanta, you're in redneck country, and you got a problem. And I follow the news carefully, and every time something happens in Georgia, I perk up and I listen. And what's been going on there now, it went from purple to to, to becoming uh, a little bit blue. And they're fighting a tooth and nail, and these are dangerous people, and we've had some murders down there in the last two years that were very high profile, that were racist. And I'm sharing that story today. And when I got back two years later, I was lucky to be alive. And uh, I want people to understand where we are, who we are, who our fellow Americans are, who we're playing ball with. This is not a political message. I didn't say anything political. Okay? I'm just reviewing parts of my career. I see them at nine and a half minutes. The show is supported by viewers like you. I ask you to please Venmo me some money at Uncle Charlie Antibi. Uncle Charlie Antibi is my Venmo. My P.O. Box is P.O. Box 100, Deal, New Jersey, 07723. Charlie Antipi is my name. Send me some checks, send me some Venmo. We need a little extra equipment so I don't got to stand here holding the phone. 
and we need sponsors as well. Thank you. God bless you. Keep tuning in.